Hello. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, it's a lovely day in Amherst, as usual. It's always a lovely day in Amherst, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we are going to talk about discrimination, labor market discrimination, which is an aspect of labor market power. Um, <clears throat> Basically, power is in labor markets where people are employed or paid uh, without, other than with regard to their productivity. And discrimination happens when and pay are set on some standard other than productivity related to a Characteristics, that is, things you're born with, um, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, um, uh, your religion, technically change religion, um, although that's not always going to be accepted by other people, um, but characteristics like those. Um, obviously will be paid differently than people. Um, that's not discrimination necessarily because those aren't good at some activities, very good at other activities. Um, but you know, if you try to get your dog to um, write an email, that's no comes time to um, smell um, you know, what happened. Um, then dogs can be much better than people at this. If it comes to um, to some, you know, who's going to be taking naps? Dogs maybe cats can be very good at taking naps. Um, discrimination in labor markets. Why economists? But they um, age may or may not be. You know, consider discrimination. More old person uh, that maybe because you don't like people, um, they smell bad, um, they look funny, whatever. Um, or it may be that you know, for the type of physical that you need, it won't be so good. Um, uh, race. It's pretty hard to see how that is associated with any characteristics, any meaningful uh, productivity character. Um, uh, disability, um, somebody gets around in a wheelchair may not be so good at um, moving furniture. Um, you know, station may or may not for some of the same characteristics. Okay. Uh, well, we much discrimination happens outside of labor markets. That major focus is on labor markets, but discrimination also happens in product markets, which is kind of a little weird. Um, but yeah, yeah, call stuff, charge more for it. That, um, okay. Competitive markets will eliminate it. You know, people will be paid according to their productivity. A company that pays people less because black or old or female um, uh, won't be able to retain good workers. Companies will come in, swoop up all the good workers, um, and drive them out of business. But even in the orthodox approach, discrimination can be maintained if discrimination actually lowers productivity. Um, women facing sexual harassment, for example, um, may be less productive, will be paid less, and they won't be employed in certain jobs, even though they could be fully productive, equally productive, more productive. Um, blacks um, can be less efficient because um, you know they were denied adequate uh, proper schooling because of segregated schools in the South or sometimes in the North. Um, they may have lacked access to 
um, proper health care because of discrimination um, or because their property was destroyed um, by uh, racist violence, restricting access to training, um, due discrimination um, dramatically in some fields, especially where training is regulated through the government. Um, less success in occupations depending on worker and company managed training program. Um, and discrimination can lower wages for women and minorities by crowding workers into certain occupations. Um, racist or sexist violence um, that crowds people into certain occupations can drive down their wages. Um, okay. Is why a kind of usually ignore or too often ignored nation. Um, Jackie Rob. Great baseball player. He was captain in the US Army, maybe lieutenant. Um, US Army during World War II, played in the Negro Leagues, um, was recruited by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, he was really good. He world of the Yankees. Um, famous for hilarious. And uh, Yogi Berra coined a great many phrases. Um, Yankees won that World Series, by the way. <clears throat> now, there's a popular story. <clears throat> You've all heard that African-Americans were not allowed to play Major League Baseball before they were arrested. Um, one is indulged the taste of discrimination by only honoring white players, or indulged the fans, the white fans' taste for discrimination. Um, it's, you know, um, um, some whites were very good, by the way. Other whites Whites got jobs only because better black players weren't around, weren't allowed to play. Uh, first of all, it's not true. African Americans played in the major leagues before Robinson. They were driven out with the rise of Jim Crow in the 1890s. There's a story here, and it's one we should pay attention to. Um, you know, Americans, you like to think of their history as progressive, things get better and better. So we had slavery. We did away with slavery. Then we had segregation. We did away with segregation. Well, uh, we had slavery. We did away with slavery. We passed the Reconstruction Amendments, 13th ended slavery, 14th established equality before the law, and 15th established right to vote. And for 10, 15 years, Blacks had meaningful civil rights even in the South. Um, gradually, um, progressively, the Ku Klux Klan and other white racist terrorist groups generally organized around Confederate war veterans, um, beat people up, lynched them, killed them, and by the 1880s and 90s had, just had prevented Blacks from voting, um, destroyed independent Black property um, and driven the Blacks uh, in the South almost down to slavery again. It didn't quite happen that way in the North, although there was a certain amount of segregation reestablished. Um, but, you know, Black members elected to Congress from Northern states, um, especially after blacks started leaving the South in the 19th, you know, World War I and later, um, moving to northern cities. Um, uh, this rise of Jim Crow and establishment of segregation was um, uh, the uh, blacks. Um, <laughs> uh, Blacks literally, you know, called the Negro Leagues. And some of them, like the Kansas, was 
um, the Homestead Grays. Uh, um, and uh, let's see, uh, where, it's Montreal. There's a team in Montreal. Okay, Boston Blues. I thought there was a team in, uh, no, no, I'm not seeing. I thought there was a team in Montreal, and I thought that's where um, Jackie Robinson played. Um, anyway, uh, uh, these were all owned by the white owners who won for their white leagues. Um, they often played in the same stadiums, um, and they attracted big crowds. The Negro Leagues were a real successful thing. They pioneered like baseball, free agency. They played a very aggressive game. Um, you know, stole a lot of bases. They did all the stuff that New York Yankees don't do and should. They had batting helmets, shin guards for catchers, which were invented by, what's that guy? Um, uh, Bud Fowler invented shin guards. Um, and when Black players did come to the white, formerly white major leagues, MLB, Major League Baseball, um, this exciting game with them. And they made baseball much more fun. Um, now, no doubt that was part of what Branch Rickey was thinking about. Um, but also, he just, the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, or the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, he just thought it was time to stop acting like racist. We just fought a war against the Nazis. Um, Donald Trump's uh, father was on the wrong side of this, but we had fought a war against the Nazis, against Hitler, against racism. Um, and Branch Rickey thought that it was time for us to stop acting like such goddamn racists in our own country. So, 1947, he said, Fuck this, and he hired Jackie Robinson. Other teams had a chance, including the Boston Red Sox, um, but they passed it over. Ricky just thought it was wrong. Um, and he also figured, I mean, Ricky, Branch Ricky did this for the right reasons, but he also knew that Jackie Robinson was going to bring an exciting. He was a really good player. He was going to bring exciting baseball to the Brooklyn Dodgers. And he knew that being in Brooklyn, he had a fan base that was heavily Jewish and would support um, desegregation, um, which is what happened. You know, um, my father told me that when um, my father was a Yankee fan throughout his life, except for one year, 1947. He said everybody rooted for the Dodgers. Everybody wanted, um, you know, my father in Brooklyn. Everybody wanted the Dodgers to do well and Jackie Robinson to succeed. Now, it was smart business. Apart from anything else, the Dodgers sold more tickets and they had a more successful season. Robinson played. Almost 300 balls, stole 29 bases, rookie of the year, and the Dodgers went to the World Series where the Yankees won. Yes. <laughs> Mike, I could root for the Dodgers, but okay. Um, it did take the, Do the Dodgers a while, but they did. Uh, eight years later, they beat the Yankees, 1955. Um, the Dodgers won the pennant six out of the next 10 years. Wow, <laughs> you know, um, they did really well. Uh, and other teams went right there. Now, the Dodgers did lead the way in recruiting additional players, uh, black players. They got Roy Campanella, catcher, great catcher, um, tragically um, paralyzed in an auto accident, um, cutting short his career. Don Newcomb. MVP uh, pitcher. Um, Newcomb, uh, those of you who are into this kind of thing, 1951, uh, the Dodgers and Giants finished in a perfect tie. They had a three game playoff. Newcomb gave up a home run in the ninth inning, uh, walk off home run in the ninth inning of the first game. Dodgers won the second game. 
ninth inning of the third game, Newcomb gave up another walk-off home run. Um, apparently, he was also a very good hitter. Okay. Uh, African-American players were ready to compete, ready to out-compete. And teams that refused to hire African-Americans lost games and lost fans. Competition forced every other major league team within 13 years, every other major league team had recruited black players. Um, for a while, they were better on average. And this continued into the 1970s. Black players, the gap narrowed, but they were better than white players for quite a while. Um, uh, because the best black players weren't being let in. But over time, the gap narrowed. Whites learned to compete with the type of exciting baseball that blacks had been playing in the Negro Leagues. And also, um, they started letting in more and more black players. You started with the best, you know, with the Jackie Robinsons, the Campanellas, the Newcomb, the Willie Mays. Um, Larry Doby, you start with the best, and over time you start letting in just, you know, regular people. Um, so that by the 1970s, black players were about the same as white players on average. Um, the same thing happened for Hispanic players. When the first, I mean, there hadn't been the same clear line keeping Hispanics out, uh, but um, in the 1970s, the Toronto Blue Jays um, started recruiting players from the Dominican Republic. Just nobody had done it before. I don't think it was conscious discrimination. They just, nobody had quite thought of it. Uh, the Blue Jays being from Canada were a little bit more international. Uh, it was the same for the Montreal Expos, who are now the Washington Nationals. The Montreal Expos also recruited players from Latin America ahead of, of um, teams from the United States. Uh, the result was the Blue Jays and the Nationals got a, a competitive advantage. Um, they started recruiting players that were really good and just had been passed over by other major league teams that just weren't I don't think it was that much that they didn't want Hispanic players. So there probably was a certain amount of discrimination so much as they just didn't notice them. Okay, now winners and losers. Who won from discrimination? Racist owners, because they didn't have to deal with black players, with African-Americans. Um, and they didn't want to have to sit across the table and negotiate a contract with a black man. Um, and they didn't have to. Mediocre white players. You know, Jackie Robinson replaced some second baseman on the Brooklyn Dodgers. Not sure who, but somebody could look it up. Um, and that guy lost his job. That white guy lost his job. Um, you notice the Negro Leagues lost out, which included many of the same people who owned the major, or the white, what had been the white major leagues. Um, but also some of them were people who all they owned was a baseball team, a black baseball team. And they lost out because those teams, first they tried to compete um, by paying players more, and then they just gave up. They didn't, they didn't have the fan base, especially when the, major, the white, major, what had been the white major leagues got better. People who just preferred to watch blacks, African-Americans play baseball, they lost out. Um, the losers from discrimination were African-American players. And they were the winners from ending discrimination. But Jackie Robinson playing for, um, I think it was the Kansas City Monarchs. Might have been a team in Montreal, I'm not sure. Uh, but the team that he had been playing for didn't pay him as much as the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Brooklyn Dodgers could pay him a lot more. Major League fans lost out because they didn't get to see Better baseball. Um, okay, African American players kept out of the major leagues, suffered financially, and fans lost a chance to see them play. The owners of the Negro Leagues benefited, as did relatively mediocre white players. 
Um, the race is Red Sox. You knew I was going to say this. You knew I was going there. Um, you were waiting, and here it is. The race is Red Sox were the last team to integrate. And they paid a price. In fact, they continued to be notably white into the 1990s. And there were black players on the Red Sox who talked in the 1980s, who talked about how difficult it was to play with the Red Sox because the team was just not friendly. You know, they would um they would treat the black players worse. Um, they passed over a lot of good players. Yeah, you know, the Sox won the American League pennant in what 46? They didn't win it again for 20 years till 1967. Um, they didn't win a World Series until you should know the answer to that one. 2004. Um, and uh um, which was 10 years after or eight years after Theo Epstein um, and the Henry Group bought the Red Sox from the Yorkie Group. Uh, it was not 10 years, but a couple years after. Um, and the York and the Henry Group um, and Theo Epstein, like, we're not going <laughs> to, we want to put a, the best team we can on the field. We're going to act like everybody else. Um, everybody else has learned to stop being racist. We're going to bring the Red Sox into the 20th century before it ends, <laughs> and uh, we're going to stop being racist. And when they did, they started recruiting people like Pedro Martinez um, and uh, um, David Ortiz, um, and they won the World Series. Oh, and Manny. And we park. Let's see, were they all whites there? Yeah, no, I don't, can't tell. Okay, now, autonomous conclude from the baseball experience because, God, it's pathetic how male economists love to talk about sports. I mean, the fact is, if you were any decent, if you were any good at sports, or if you were half good looking, um, or you know, just had anything else going for you. You didn't spend your life inside a library or staring at a computer screen. I mean, the fact is that male economists are socially inept and that's why they become economists. Yeah, sure, most academics, uh, male academics. I mean, this is not an occupation that most people choose if they could become, if they had been king of the prom or um, first string quarterback. Um, uh, but that said, uh, so economists love to think about baseball and talk about it. Um, and most think that if there's competition, talent will find a way like Jackie Robinson did. I mean, okay, Jackie Robinson did in 1947. That was 50, 50 plus years after Blacks were thrown out of the major leagues. Um, so why did it take that long? And if competition is such a powerful force, why did the major leagues throw Black players out in the first place? Okay, but so economists, and this goes back to Gary Becker, um, brilliant uh, Nobel Prize winning economist from the University of Chicago, <coughs> um, argues that well, if there's discrimination, if it persists, then it must be because of government, um, maybe unions. You know, there's something to this. You know, um, competition has eroded discrimination for some groups. Um, and some of the groups that have faced the most discrimination in America have flourished anyway. Take the Japanese. Um, Japanese Americans, 200,000 Japanese Americans were thrown into concentration camps at the beginning of World War II. They were loaded onto trains and buses and shipped from California to uh, prison camps, concentration camps in Arkansas and places like that. No, these are concentration camps, not extermination camps. Uh, but still, 
you know, it was a horrible thing. They had to sell their property often with 24, 48 hour notice. They got, they had been very successful uh, farmers in Central Valley in California. Um, they had to sell their property. Some, you know, they owned land in San Francisco, other urban locales. They had to sell it at a major loss. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? George Takai, Sulu, um, grew up in one of those camps. Um, that notwithstanding, Japanese Americans are one of the wealthiest and most successful, economically successful um, ethnic groups in America. And it's not just that so many live in Hawaii when they were not thrown into concentration camps, even though the Japanese consul in Hawaii, nothing to do with Japanese Americans, but the consul, uh, the consulate in Honolulu had a spy who regularly went and took pictures of Battleship Row and the lineup of the U.S. Navy at uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, and Americans, American intelligence paid no attention to him. Um, okay. Irish Americans faced major discrimination um, through the 19th and, well, you really well into the 20th century. Um, Italians, um, U.S. born Asians, other than Japanese, Chinese, um, Indians would, South Asians were just banned completely, um, uh, and Jews. Um, <laughs> you know, Ivy League schools uh, actively discriminated against Jewish applicants. Um, Columbia, less so, but even Columbia, um, uh, by the time I was applying in the 70s, they didn't call it a quota, a Jewish quota, but they called it a ge geographical distribution. And it just happened that um, giving a preference to people who did not live in New York City or the Boston area um, uh, meant that you were giving a preference to non-Jews um, and non-Asians. Um, uh, oh, wait, there we go. Okay. How then, given that, you know, uh, <laughs> if you take these groups, Jews are the richest group by far, um, Japanese Americans, are uh, second, except for South Asians born in the United States, Chinese Americans, those born in the United States are very well off. The Asian numbers are distorted because all immigrants are poorer than native born people. Um, adjustment course. Um, Irish Americans have done much better than Protestant Americans, Irish Catholic Americans, um, and Italians have above average income. So all of these groups, all these white and Asian groups have overcome discrimination. Um, how then to explain this? Persistent discrimination against Blacks, Hispanics, and women. There's something missing in the uh, competitive story. Now, discrimination persists where it's tolerated. Yeah, you know, against Jews, it real, you know, Jews were doing better economically than non Jews. Um, but the big boom in Jewish wealth and income came after World War II um, and the experience of fighting fascists, fighting Nazis. Uh, Anti Semitism kind of became a bad thing. Um, and then, ironically, um, among the biggest beneficiaries of the civil rights revolution of the 1960s. And very few people were thinking about this at the time, um, were Jews. All the civil rights laws banned discrimination against Jews in employment and housing. And all of a sudden, Jews were able to get into, bed, into schools, into jobs, into neighborhoods that they couldn't get into before. Um, and since Jews often had the money or the education, they were able to take advantage of it, often more than other groups. Um, but discrimination where it's tolerated um, continues to bite. And it is very much tolerated against women, Hispanics, Asians, and especially 
African Americans. Um, and discrimination persists where it actually undermines the victim's productivity. Jackie Robinson learned to play baseball as a kid. He learned to play baseball in the army and he learned to play baseball in the Negro Leagues. He was all ready to go to the major leagues. But in other occupations, access to training can be restricted. Um, uh, back in 1971, not that long ago. Um, okay, it's long ago for you guys. But, um, but back in 1971, the head of Harvard Med, Harvard Medical School, um, testified before a Senate committee, and he explained that Harvard Medical School did not admit women because women, our job is to create doctors, to train doctors, and women often drop out, have children, or whatever, um, so you don't get as many doctors. So we only admit men. Now, that was already illegal. And over time, the government started cracking down on it. But if you keep women from being trained as doctors, then guess what? You don't have women doctors. If you keep blacks from getting into good colleges, then you don't have highly educated blacks. Um, instead, what happens is women, blacks, others facing discrimination, they get this idea that oh, I'm not going to be able to succeed in that occupation because of prejudice. So I should concentrate on this occupation. Yeah. Um, so instead of becoming doctors, women become nurses. Instead of becoming um, financial analysts, African-Americans maybe become basketball players. Um, uh, and some of these are relatively inefficient fields. I mean, yeah, sure, some basketball NBA stars make tons of money, um, but it's generally a bad investment. Um, and nurses do not make as much money as doctors. Um, discrimination often acts along a continuum. Occasionally, you'll still get the blatant discrimination. We don't want women. No Irish need apply. Sometimes just make it hard for people. Um, okay, you know, we'll hire a woman, but um, example, uh, a few years ago, um, I was at a bakery in Amherst um, and uh, I asked for a loaf of bread. Woman turned around, woman cashier, you know, counter person turned around and um, uh, I saw that she was wearing a jacket from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So being obnoxious and just couldn't resist, I asked her, if you are in the IBEW, why are you working at a counter? I mean, being an electrician pays a lot better than this. I didn't say that, but it was obvious. And she explained that uh, there was an affirmative action program and they had to admit women to the apprenticeship program. But they made it hard for them. Their tools disappeared. They were sent out to get coffee. Um, and she said, I wasn't tough enough. Not her fault. You know, most men might, many men wouldn't be tough enough by that criteria. There were some women who made it through the apprenticeship program. And there are women who survived the Air Force Academy. Uh, but there's a lot of hostility and things get difficult. Um, and it's not, you know, you're not lynching these people, but you're making life hard for them. And then there's the often very subtle. Um, for example, legacy preferences. You know, you want to get into Harvard? It really helps if your father or my, well, it would only be fathers, um, were Harvard grads, you know. Well, I guess it could be your mother now. Um, Harvard started admitting women on an equal basis in the 80s. You know, I know that when I was there, 
uh, women were still admitted to Radcliffe and given a Radcliffe diploma, um, even though classes were integrated. Um, us, now, if you have a history of discrimination against Blacks or Jews or women or whoever, Legacy admissions is affirmative action for white Christian males. Um, and it's a big boost. Um, you know, uh, it's worth some very large amount on your um, SAT scores. Now, blatant discrimination, women do better on blinded violin auditions. <laughs> you know, Claudia Golden, had this, this lead article, I think, in the American Economic Review. Um, yeah, she really nailed it on that one. But NBA refs give blacks more fouls. White NBA umpires call more strikes for white pitchers. White names are 50% more likely to be called for job interviews. This is why, by the way, this is true of uh, I don't think I have it here, but it's also true for male names, which is why um, so many parents give their daughters male names, male sounding names. Um, and parents of sons move away from those names. Sydney used to be a male name and it became a female name. Um, Chris, the same. Uh, so there's a steady process where fewer and fewer <laughs> names are given <coughs> to sons. Um, black names have become very popular among in the African American communities, and it really hurts uh, their children when it comes to college admissions or jobs. Uh, then you get consumer discrimination. Women pay more for dry cleaning. Blacks are less likely to get black bank loans and they pay more for them, they pay higher interest, given the same income, um, the same background, the same uh, equivalent houses. Um, homes in black and Latino neighborhoods undervalued. Okay, there are links for all these. Okay, blatant discrimination. Racial impact of criminal record. Being a black man without a criminal record, um, uh, you have, or be, sorry, being a white with a criminal record, you are more likely to be called back for an interview, job interview, than if you're black with no criminal record. Um, and there, you know, there are legacies here. If your parents had bad schooling, it's gonna lower your schooling. Um, if your parents had uh, poor access to good schooling and less wealth. Yeah, of course, who had less wealth than slave than African Americans coming out of slavery? Then this has consequences that flow on for generations. Lack of parental wealth, past discrimination, lower access to good schools, lower access to to good jobs, um, social capital. You know. Uh, when I was in college, you know, we would joke, but it was not really a joke. We would joke about, um, you know, well, you, you take this class, that class, it's a cocktail party conversation, so you can chat up uh, bank executives and get good jobs and seem to be knowledgeable, you know. And it really does how you speak, your grammar, um, the vocabulary you use. Uh, my wife and I recently watched um, uh, this TV show, P Valley, about um, a town in Mississippi. And um, it's basically based at um, a strip club. Um, you know, pole dances are shown to be really athletic. Um, uh, it goes, I mean, there are pluses and minuses, and over the course of the second season, the minuses really start to outweigh the pluses. But uh, but they introduced one character very early on, and I don't remember offhand the word she uses, but you know, she used a word, 
And, you know, my wife and I both looked, uh, this woman had education. We don't know anything about her, but to use that word, she's educated. A, st a real standout. Um, and uh, immediately, you know, you think, well, am I going to hire this person or hire that person? Well, this person, you know, you know, seems smarter. Certainly is more educated. Um, uh, and then there's personal context. When you leave here, um, you will be looking for a job. And one thing you do is you get the names of everybody your parents know who may know something about the type of work that you want to get. And you call them. You tell them, I'm coming out of college or grad school, whatever, and I'd like advice. Could I meet you and, you know, bend your ear for 15 minutes and, you know, or have you tell me about this type of work? Old folks, adults, <laughs> postgraduate school people love to help out young people. And, oh, yeah, come on by. Never ask for a job. They will offer you something or they'll offer you somebody else. Now, if your parents have good contacts, great. If your parents don't, then you have... I mean, you may get a good job anyway, you know, you, but, you know, um, the really good jobs are all, you know, they're not, uh, yeah, okay, they'll post it, whatever. But, you know, but the really good jobs are still through the old boy network. Um, and, you know, it may not just be boys now, there may be girls, whatever, but you're know, having contacts matters. Who you know matters more than what you know. And that's how discrimination persists. Um, blatant discrimination. <laughs> well, housing bias alone is estimated to lower Black and Hispanic wealth by 50, almost $50,000, um, which is a big part of the total wealth gap, just from straight out housing bias. Black neighborhoods being undervalued, Black houses being undervalued. Slavery, segregation, violence. We could go down the list. I mean, Tulsa is famous because it was talked about in some um, HBO show. But, you know, and, and it came out that massive cover up, truly amazing, horrific. Um, and I guess it was one of the worst, but there were a lot. You know, there's Greenwood, Florida. There was Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and you go up. Well, there we go, Wilmington. You know, um, now to be sure, discrimination doesn't always ruin your life prospects. You know, um, Japanese dominated came to after World War II. Japanese moved back to California and they took over the gardening business. They had experience, training, um, they had been. Uh, large part of the Japanese American community in California were farmers. They had been very successful farmers in the uh, Central Valley. Um, and also, um, you know, many of them had, you know, family tradition of building gardens, Japanese gardens. Um, and they happened to be in the right place to do this. Los Angeles was booming in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. And it became a big thing to have a Japanese garden in your Beverly Hills backyard, um, you know, and elsewhere. And Japanese Americans became very successful at this. Um, and some groups do very well, even though they face discrimination in the past. Uh, Indian Americans, um, you know, earn more than Chinese Americans, who are more than Pakistani Americans. There's one for you. I'm not going to touch that one, though. Um, Japanese Americans don't do as well as Indian Americans or Chinese Americans, um, but all way above U.S. average. Asia, Pacific Islanders, on average, more. Um, 
not all, not all Asians and Cambodians, you know, many of whom were refugees uh, from the Khmer Rouge, Vietnamese, just about average Americans. Um, but again, some of this is heritage um, and groups with more recent migrants look worse because the averages are pulled down by the recent migrants. Um, really to do this, you wanna look at second, third generation. Um, and when it comes to the Indians, Pakistanis, and to some extent, the Chinese too, um, a lot of this is contrary to what I just said, migrants who come here with a lot of education. You know, Indian engineers leave Bangalore, Indian Pakistani doctors leave the subcontinent, come here, Chinese um, engineers come study in the United States and then start businesses. Um, uh, note also that uh, contrary to what I just said about immigrants being disadvantaged, immigrants tend to congregate in the most economically vibrant places. No surprise, you come to the United States, you're not going to go move to South Mississippi or something. You're going to want to go to New York or Boston or San Francisco or LA. Um, and that pulls up your earnings. Okay. Um, but still, there are the poverty rate is higher for non whites um, and higher for Hispanics than English speakers. So discrimination still, you know, hasn't gone away. Um, you know, older black Americans do worse. Racism raises African-American blood pressure. It's bad for your health. Um, and maybe people invest in the wrong things. Yeah, you know, the NBA doesn't discriminate against blacks, um, but, what are your real chances? Maybe you should stay indoors and read a book rather than playing basketball. African-Americans do devote more energy to sports than do white Americans. Um, uh, you know, but, you know, is that necessarily, you know, um, such a bad thing. African-American kids play to win college scholarships and make a career because sports is more meritocratic. They're gonna do better at it. I don't know. Um, and maybe African-Americans are making the right choice. You know, uh, because blacks basically do better um, in sports than they do in other areas, less discrimination. Um, women, invest heavily in activities that and things that men don't invest in. Um, beauty, often very unhealthy. Historically, women have killed themselves spreading arsenic over their face like uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, the first did in the 16th century. Um, and many beauty products still today are toxic, I hope not as much as they used to be. Um, women get up earlier than men because they have to wash their hair, put on makeup, think about what they're gonna wear. Um, and everybody, almost everybody likes looking at pretty women. Um, women like looking at pretty women. Straight women, gay women like to look at pretty women. Straight men like to look at pretty women. Homosexual men do not. Bisexual men, I assume, do. Um, but that said, um, you know, these women have spent a lot of time on their appearance. That's time that they're not spending on other things. Yeah, and some of this is happening to men too. Um, Hollywood is putting more um, weight on male physique. Um, and there's a reason for all this. You know, Dan Hammamesh is a famous labor economist um, and Angelina Jolie. Who would you like to look at? <laughs> I like Dan. 
you know, he's a smart guy and very interesting to talk to. Uh, but the fact is that employers put a real value on appearance for all sorts of jobs. 16% of factory operative positions, it matters what you look like. What? 18% of nurses? A third of construction workers? You, you're more likely to be hired if you're pretty? Bank tellers? Auto mechanics? Receptionists? You know, um, I, <laughs> I, I had a job for a summer, if you can call it a job. I worked for my father's business, um, and I made deliveries in offices. Um, and occasionally, I would go in the front door, these offices in New York, mostly New York City. Um, usually, they sent me up the you know, freight elevator or whatever, but I was so used to being a privileged white male just walking in the front and, you know, but anyway, yeah, receptionists are good looking, you know, but does it really have anything to do with the productivity? Um, the point though is if you look at these statistics, you think, I want to look pretty. I want to look good. Maybe you want to look good because you want to meet people of the opposite sex or the same sex, whatever. But, you know, um, it clearly matters more for men than for boys, for girls than for boys. Boys and girls sleep at the same time, but boys have an hour more leisure. What are women, what are girls doing? They're not getting education. Um, girls spend more time in their homework. That's interesting. Girls get higher grades, you know. Um, spend the same time eating. Girls spend um, like 25, 23 minutes more grooming. Um, they spend more time on housework. Why is that? Parents expect more of the, that of their daughters, not of their sons. They do more unpaid care work. Um, Who's pretty? We all know the answer to that. Um, I actually deleted the slide that showed somebody who's pretty. I've shown you enough of that. Um, there's also the division of labor within the family. Something to think about. And here again, Gary Becker. You know, I, I, he keeps coming up because he is such, um, you know, such a genius and contributed so much to the development of neoclassical economics. Um, for which he won the Nobel Prize. Um, and while I totally disagree with his politics, he is one of the people who does deserve to have won it. Okay, men and women assume different roles in families to take advantage of gender-specific skills. Just like you have division of labor to increase productivity in businesses, you have division of labor within families. Why do men marry women? Gary Becker would say it's because women are different than men. Men are different than women. Women are better at nurturing, they give birth, they're better at providing care. Because of that, men marry a woman with that in mind. I want somebody who's going to be a good nurturer, somebody who's going to take care of my children, raise my children well. And women, they want a man who's going to earn money because they're going to be home nurturing. So women marry older men, marry men with a higher economic strata. And they marry men who will earn money. Um, when I, when my parents vetted my girlfriends, whatever, they never cared about what job they were going to get. When they vetted my sister's boyfriends, um, you know, when you were getting to more serious positions, it's like, is he going to be able to support you? Is he going to be able to? maintain you in the um, a status to which you've become accustomed. Um, and knowing that this is the way families are going to be constructed, you know, men will be looking for a woman who is good nurturer. Women will be looking for a man who can earn a lot of money. Um, 
parents raise their children to be good at these ways. So child rearing and training should reflect this. Oh, hold on a second. I just realized I left something on the stove and it's gonna be a disaster. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just realized that I had, oh, talking of child rearing and everything, I realized I had put up a pot of water. Fortunately, the water hadn't burned off completely. Um, so uh, let's see, so we're sharing again and okay. Um, and you know, um, you raise your daughters to attract a man who will earn good money. You raise your sons to be a man who will make good money. Um, the way your daughters will attract a man is by demonstrating they, their um, caregiving. Um, well, poor dog, I stepped on his, on his head, running out the door. Ah, okay, um, consequence, gender-linked comparative advantage. We create this comparative advantage. Who babysits younger siblings? Daughters, you know. Um, you don't usually ask a boy to babysit the younger siblings. It happens. Um, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I was kind of jealous that my sisters always earned good money babysitting. Um, the girls I knew would always be babysitting, making money. Me, I could mow lawns. Yeah, um, doesn't do you much in the winter. Um, oh, I could shovel driveways. And, and, you know, we'd get snow, I'd walk around. Damn, would you rather uh, sit and read books to children or would you rather shovel a driveway? I would rather read a book to a child. Um, okay, marriage patterns, men marry down. They marry younger women. Um, marry women with lower education, lower economic strata. Women marry up. Now that's changing, which is interesting. All the stuff that Becca talks about is eroding. And we're moving towards symmetric relationships rather than comparative advantage. We're moving towards um, marriages on the basis of sharing rather than uh, um, division of labor. Uh, but employer expectations contribute to gender-based hiring. You know, we expect that employers have traditionally expected that women will take on this caregiving role in families. So women who got married would often be fired. They'd be a marriage boy. You'd get a big party, uh, celebrate your marriage, and then be fired. Sometimes women would continue to work, but only until they were had, until they were pregnant. Um, or they started to show. So many school districts into the 1970s would fire women when they started to show. Um, other times women would continue, they, well, that was declared illegal, gender discrimination. After all, it's never an issue for men. Um, so women would uh, continue to work as teachers even after giving birth. Um, they'd have that option. Oftentimes they take time off. Companies that expect that women will be taking a lot of time off to work, to raise children, won't hire them for certain jobs because they expect that they're gonna be leaving. Um, men, on the other hand, you find out that they're going to get married, have children, you give them a premium because after all, this guy's gonna to have to keep his job and he's gonna be really energetic to try to get a raise so he can pay for the family. This is changing some, but not as much as you might want. Restrictive access to training. You don't need blatant you, to discrim, you don't need blatant discrimination if you can keep blacks and women, et cetera, from acquiring necessary skills. Training discrimination, consider plumbers, economists, and doctors. All three are good jobs. They pay well. And in 1970, they were all almost exclusively white male preserves. Paul Samuelson, um, the uh, famous economist. Um, uh, wait, um, plumbers. Um, I don't know what they're doing and I don't wanna know about it. Doctors, 
Um, uh, oh, more economists. That's what's his name. Um, Doug North. Okay. Uh, nowadays, some of these occupations, doctors, lawyers, college professors, a lot of women in them. Um, some occupations continue to be basically exclusively female. And then there are all these other occupations that are still male. Why is it that more women lawyers, more women doctors, more women college professors, but not more women plumbers? Plumbers earn a lot of money. Electricians earn good money. Carpenters, not as good as electricians. Bricklayers, not as good as carpenters. Uh, firefighters, they earn good money. It's also really dangerous work. Uh, but anyway, uh, why are there so few women economists uh, compared to other women occupations? Women make up 10% of the authors in economics over the history of the profession. It's a little better now, but not that much. Very few Blacks or Latinos. A lot of Asians, by the way. Um, why is economics different from the other social sciences? I mean, anthropology, 10% um, underrepresented minorities. History, almost 10%. Economics, 3%, 4%? What gives? Um, women and underrepresented minorities have different experiences. The economics profession is worse. Our understanding of the economy is worse because we don't have more women, more minorities. Yeah. Um, now, if you want to earn more, don't go where women go. <laughs> Occupations close to women or with very few women have higher average pay. It's always interesting to me that in labor economic analysis, if you put in as a variable to explain wages, the proportion of women in the occupation, that is a very, very powerful variable. A lot of the variation in earnings across people and occupations is because of how many women are in, in that occupation. On the other hand, very, that very rarely do male economists put that variable into their analysis. Why not? This is the most important thing. Um, you know, age, experience, education. Yeah, but how many women in that profession? Um, some occupations are very few men. Why don't men want these jobs? They're yeah, feminine, unmanly, relatively low wages because they're open to women. And yeah, they compete with family labor. You know, this baby could be home with mom or dad. But now it's in a daycare. So this young woman is competing with mom and dad, or maybe older sibling, or maybe grandmother. Um, why do women continue taking these jobs? They're feminine. They're good training for being a mother and caregiver. Oh, you know, study psychology so that you'll be good at raising children and taking care of your husband. They can work with other women. It's safe than working with men. You know, that is a major factor as so many actresses have found in Hollywood. Um, when I was uh, uh, just starting here, um, I found out because I was living next door to a female graduate student and we would carpool together. Um, and she told me about one of my colleagues um, who had wandering hands and female graduate students would only go into his office in pairs. They would never, you never go in on your own. That kind of atmosphere is just really, I don't think that we have situations like that anymore. This guy retired shortly after I learned this. Um, it's also embarrassing on behalf of UMass and UMass economics that he retired because he chose to, had nothing to do. He wasn't pushed out. He wasn't reprimanded for this behavior. Um, and there are worse stories than that. So, you know, most women don't want to be the only woman 
in those types of situations. Um, occupations with more women, trainings and schools. You know, what I just said about schools, that's nothing compared to what goes on outside of the academy because we are under a microscope. Um, we have to explain um, our behavior. We have Title IX rules. We have the equal employment, whatever the, the diversity, equity, inclusion, associate chancellor. We've got all sorts of things that we have to explain, groups that we have to explain to, um, which is a good thing. And the academy has opened up and women are being treated much more fairly, maybe even close to fairly. Um, and uh, underrepresented minorities are, are being treated much better. Um, not that everything's great, but outside of the academy, yeah, it's much worse. Um, this, this is Harvey Weinstein. This is Larry Summers, who I've often brought up as a very good economist. He's also an asshole and a pig. Um, it was very difficult for women to get tenure at Harvard when he was president. Um, tenure rates for women were much higher before he came in and much higher after he left. Coincidence? Where men in an occupation control access to trade, they use that, that control to keep out women. Sure, just like white baseball players were happy that blacks um, didn't get into the major leagues. Yeah, it keeps the trade manly, maintains high wages by reducing competition, avoids the need for separate restrooms, and you can put up porn in the bathrooms. I remember that one summer when I had a real job. I had a real job then, and I had a real job for one year after college before grad school when I worked for a research staff of a labor union. Not exactly, you know, uh, typical employment, especially since halfway through I was admitted to grad school. And I was like, fuck this. I don't like this job that much. Um, uh, so that one summer, that's my experience in the real world, um, such as it is. As somebody came up to me my second day on the job, told me, don't work so hard. You're making us look bad. And you know what? Your father owns the company. You're not going to get fired. Seriously. Um, anyway, the main thing I think is, you know, high, maintain high wages. White men in an occupation gain by keeping women and minorities out. Crowding women into other occupations. I mean, if women can't get jobs as plumbers, what do they do? They become receptionists, driving down wages for receptionists. Women can't become doctors, they become nurses. Consumers lose. We have to pay more for doctors because we don't give women doctors. We have to pay more for plumbers. Um, on the other hand, if we want a receptionist, eh, it's great. Childcare, for example, becomes cheaper. And men can find female spouses more easily. To maintain discrimination, you have to keep people from being trained. That's where baseball is different. The trades restrict access to the trades, and economics was like this until recently, and maybe still is. Not, a, not UMass economics. Ugh, keep those people from, okay, crowding labor markets with and without discrimination. Plumbers, this is the way it would be without discrimination. You'd have some men, maybe fewer than, than some women, maybe fewer than men, maybe women don't like getting their hands dirty, whatever. You know, but you get a total no discrimination with a wage over here and lots of jobs. Child care, some men, maybe fewer than women, whatever. And you get a total with a wage. It's maybe lower than for plumbers because after all, there are a lot of things about being a plumber that are unpleasant. There may be things about being child care that are unpleasant. I don't know, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Now, what happens with when you don't allow women to become plumbers? This becomes the labor supply curve for a while. It's only here. Wage goes from here to here. And when women can't get jobs as plumbers, they have to get jobs in childcare. So the wage goes from here down to here because of that excess supply. Great for childcare. Want childcare? Don't let women become plumbers. 
but you want plumbing, don't crowd women into childcare. Crowding has winners and losers. Winners are male plumbers and consumers of childcare. Losers are women who wanted to be plumbers, women childcare workers, and consumers of plumbing. Now, competition will not eliminate this type of crowding if it's about training. If you don't let women become trained as plumbers, there are no women plumbers to train other women. And the men seek their advantage by keeping women out. It's just going to stay this way. Male plumbers have no interest in allowing women to become plumbers. Uh, maybe they want their daughter to have a good job. I don't know. And there are no Negro leagues to train women plumbers. And government mandates so far have been ineffective. It's not like, you know, we have to report how many women apply, how many not underrepresented minorities apply, and how many we admit. When it comes to hiring, we have to report how many women, how many underrepresented minorities. And we have to explain if we didn't hire somebody from one of these groups. Um, you know, they really, like I said, we're under a microscope. That doesn't happen for plumbing. And by limiting career choices, lowering women's wages, encourages women to specialize in this non-market work. Yeah. And look for jobs as a homemaker married to a high-earning man. Yeah. And this allows even funny-looking guys to get dates. Not bad for men. Okay, takeaway points. Economists dismiss discrimination. They assume competitive markets will eliminate it. Uh -uh. Maintained by restricting access to training. Um, and government has been effective where government policy has been actively carried out and crowded. Okay. Thank you all. Um, this is a big issue. And I'm glad that we've been able to take a little extra time to talk about it. Um, uh, it's another way that, you know, focusing on competitive markets, you know, really misses a lot of the point. Okay. And by the way, my pot of water had almost all boiled off, but not completely. So waste of water, waste of heat, but yeah, otherwise, no harm done. I will be able to refill it cook it up again and um dinner maybe a little later not a big deal okay live long and prosper have a good day enjoy economics because economics is life there's a was it oh ted lasso this guy is very enthusiastic about soccer football is life no he's wrong economics is life and economics is great it's fun um, okay, we'll talk more next time. Thank you.